Many councils recognise the benefits that a sustainable approach to procurement can deliver to their community. And procurement teams are often being called upon to harness councils' purchasing power to create positive impacts for their local communities. So in our webinar today, we're going to chat about two ways that councils can move beyond the traditional sustainable procurement practices of at simply adding a standard sustainability schedule and sometimes weighting the criteria into their tendering process to instead take a more a strategic approach to create real and positive impact on your council and your community. So the first I will talk about today is evaluating for impact. So general feedback that we get at LGP through our annual sustainable procurement survey and also through our various interactions with councils and also suppliers as well, is that a supplier's response to sustainability criteria and their sustainability performance often doesn't make the difference between winning or not winning a contract. Now, there could be a few reasons why this is the case, and that is that the criteria is not weighted. Uh, the criteria weighting is so comparably low that it can't make a difference regardless. The sustainability requirements are added on rather than incorporated into the overall delivery of the contract. Or the criteria are not being evaluated according to the impact of the sustainability initiative initiatives offered by the tenderers, but rather whether there is an initiative there. And this final point is the one that I'd like to go into on further detail, as it's the one that has the potential to make a real difference in the tendering outcome. So there are two important considerations when evaluating on impact. And those are, it's about asking about what matters and asking what difference it makes. So tailoring questions so that they align with relevant sustainability issues for your council and community and including what opportunities and you know, specifically sustainability opportunities have been identified for the project or contract. Conducting a sustainability risk and opportunity analysis at the commencement of the tender process is useful to identify these and also informing yourself and understanding your council's sustainability objectives and goals before undertaking any procurement activity is essential. So for example, if your council has a carbon reduction strategy with targets, including questions relating to emissions reduction and low carbon will align with this strategy. So to better ensure that the criteria contribute to the outcome of the tendering process, going that next step and including questions that are also ask tenderers to demonstrate the impact that their emission reduction or low carbon policies and initiatives have had, will help to separate and highlight those suppliers where their sustainability initiatives are in fact translating to beneficial outcomes that will contribute to council's sustainability goals and positively to your local communities. So for example, two tenderers can claim that they have an emissions reduction strategy in the organisations. So one tenderer may be able to provide you with a percentage reduction in their carbon emissions in the past year, whereas another is unable to demonstrate that their policies or initiatives have resulted in any reduction in their carbon emissions. So being able to get that information out of them through the tendering process, that will enable a clear distinction to be made between the two in that evaluation process and will help you to ensure that you get a, a supplier on board that aligns closely with your carbon reduction strategy and can help you meet that. Okay, so, Another way to create real positive impact for local communities relates to engaging local suppliers. So providing opportunities for local businesses has always been an important issue for many councils. Uh, and this has been magnified as small businesses struggle to cope with the impacts of natural disasters and also COVID-19. 
and councils also are now recognising that engaging local suppliers can improve their resilience to disasters. So that's not only suppliers' resili resilience, but also the council's resilience. So many do this by giving additional scoring to businesses within a certain geographical radius through the tendering process. However, this approach doesn't always result in increased local business engagement or in gaining value for money, which is of course essential, an essential requirement when spending local money. Um, so many local businesses can actually compete very effectively in their own right without the need to give them a handicap when you approach the procurement process from a sustainability viewpoint. So building sustainability outcomes into the, the deliverables in the same way as other requirements can actually advantage local suppliers as they have the potential to deliver on so many sustainability benefits, in particular when it comes to demonstrating beneficial local social impact. So when approaching the procurement process from a sustainability viewpoint, sustainability outcomes are built into de the deliverables in the same way as other requirements. For example, if you want your supplier to purchase materials locally, this is stated up front. Similarly, if you want local tra tradespeople employed as subcontractors, this is also stated up front. Since local suppliers already have local contacts and networks set up, it's easier for them to provide these deliverables, which means they're already ahead of the non-local competitors. Similarly, it is easier for local suppliers to employ local people for council jobs because they probably already do. This approach also means you can deliver local benefits even when there is no local capability to undertake your entire project and you need to award the contract to a non-local supplier by asking for a demonstration of local impact and commitment under contract, local suppliers will be awarded pieces of the work by the successful contractor. So now I'm going to invite our guest speaker today. For, we're going to do a beachside chat. Given that we're coming into summer, we didn't think that a fireside chat was probably very comfortable in this warm weather. So we're going with a beachside chat. And I'd like to um, introduce you and welcome to our guest speaker, Bronwyn Chellis. So Bronwyn is LGP's business development manager for the Northern region. But prior to working for LGP, Bronwyn worked in procurement for a number of councils and is very experienced in embedding sustainability into council procurement processes. So hi Bronwyn and welcome. Thank you Tanya, it's very lovely to be here. Hello everyone. Great. Now I've got a few questions for you. Um, so the first one is, you know, drawing on your previous experience working within councils, what were the biggest challenges you faced when it came to increasing local content and how did you overcome these challenges? I think the, uh, the biggest challenge, even though it may not seem so on the surface, is actually identifying um, what local means. It's um, often different depending on who you ask, but also understanding what your objectives are um, for wanting to um, provide work to local suppliers. So um, what area is local? Is it just your LGA? Is it your region? Is it the neighbouring LGAs? Um, I think it's really important to be able to identify that so that everyone at council, um, as well as the community, is clear on what, um, what is meant by local. And often that will be a geographical uh, answer. The other thing is to think about is what, um, what your objectives are for um, Lo using local suppliers. So are you looking to uh, e increase local employment or are you looking for local economic development? And the answer to that will then um, identify how you go about um, using local suppliers. So is a local presence enough or do you want locally owned businesses? Because um, if, if, you're just use if you're just looking to in um, increase local employment, then having a local presence is, is enough. So think about um, Bunnings, for example, provides um, you know, a large amount of local employment compared to um, 
a smaller locally owned hardware business that might employ fewer people. But if your um, objective is local economic development, then your pick is the locally owned business because the money stays in the local community because it's locally owned. So my recommendation, if councillors or um, management come to you and say, hey, we need to start spending more locally, that I'd stop them and say, well, can you tell me what you mean by local? And what are the objectives that you're looking to achieve through using more local suppliers? Because that will then set your, um, set your direction. You could also um, do this yourself by putting a discussion paper up to uh, the elected council or to your executive to start a conversation on this and, um, and get some answers and some clear direction for um, how you go about using more local suppliers. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, so next, I was going to ask you, so what about when it comes to getting the best supplier on, term in, on board in terms of delivering products and services that align with council sustainability objectives? Well, I think this is uh, all about balance and recognising that uh, different stakeholders in the procurement will have different um, requirements. So, for example, the budget holders might be looking for um, at price and reliability, making sure the job can get done, whereas uh, the procurement or the sustainability folk might also be looking at those sustainability objectives. So, I think balance is important and also as you already mentioned, when sustainability is given, you know, the sustainability schedule is given five or ten percent, it really makes a difference um, to the outcome of the tender. But what does make a difference is actually integrating those sustainability requirements so they become part of the overall delivery of the project. So if you're looking um, for use of local supplies, um, you can ask about that in the resources section so that you're not evaluating it separately but part of the overall um, evaluation. So this means that you're evaluating price, reliability, all those things and sustainability becomes part of that so that the suppliers that can deliver on all the requirements um, are much better place to win the work than uh, one who's you know, very good at sustainability but maybe very high in price or vice versa, good price, less sustainability. So by actually integrating your requirements, it also sends a message to the suppliers that sustainability isn't an optional extra nice to have. It's actually part of what councils want delivered. Uh, the other thing is to keep it simple. I've seen some councils that have very uh, complicated, even convoluted local preference um, processes. And the neighbouring council doesn't have a local preference policy at all. And the actual percentage of their budget spent locally was the same. So the first council was jumping through a lot of hoops, making things very complicated for themselves and the suppliers and not actually really achieving what their objectives were. So yes, you can have an effective local preference policy, but I think it's important to keep it simple and um, look at what you're actually, it's actually helping you to achieve. And finally, um, I think it's important to communicate with your suppliers about what your sustainability objectives are. Talking to suppliers uh, over the years, often they say, look, if council will just tell us what it is that they want us to deliver, then we can provide that. But you need to tell them. So be upfront with what you're trying to achieve and then the suppliers will be able to respond accordingly. Great, thank you. Um... Now, in terms of, um, okay, so you've embedded this sustainability in, and then, you know, recognising the importance of actually then evaluating the impacts of any initiative, um, what advice and guidance can you share in terms of measuring the benefits of procurement activities to the community? And I know this is a really tricky one because I know Measuring sustainable procurement anywhere in the world globally is very difficult. So um, in terms of your, in your experience, what can you tell us about this? Well, I think this is absolutely crucial uh, because this actually is how you demonstrate the positive impacts for your community that uh, procurement can deliver. 
also I would um, suggest that you start simple and start where you can. Um, I think a lot of people in the past have got stuck because they try to measure everything and end up measuring nothing because it's just too complicated and they never really get started because they're too busy focused on the, like, everything they want to do. So I've got a, a few examples of how you can get started with this and how you can create some really powerful messaging with some quite simple measurements. So the first one would be to understand how much your council spends with local suppliers already. And this is often um, quite a bit more than, than what people might think. So calculate how much you spend with a locally owned business. And the American Express Shop Small report uh, says that for every dollar spent uh, with a locally owned business, 45 cents is reinvested back into the local community. So that's through salary, um, through buying locally, mainly and sponsorships things like that so take your spend with locally owned businesses multiply it by 0.45 and you have how much your procurement function is how much money your procurement function is reinvesting back into the community through purchasing um, goods and services and that itself is a really good place to um, to start showing the impact that it does have on the community Another thing is to understand the level of local employment that your council contracts are providing uh, in your LGA. So this is as simple as asking the suppliers that you have contracts with. Look, how, ask them, as a result of council contract, how many people do you employ that you wouldn't otherwise? And you might find that some businesses will say it's worth three people or two or five or whatever it is, but if you think of how many locally owned businesses you use, that number can quickly add up. And again, if you can say, look, through council contracts, we're providing employment for, I don't know, 100 people, then that's another good news story um, and quite simple to do. Uh, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is think about how you're managing your contracts. So suppliers will often make commitments in their quotes or tenders uh, for what they'll deliver as part of the project, including uh, you know, sustainability objectives. And often they kind of just get forgotten and no one ever checks to see if those things have been, um, been delivered as part of the, the contract. So for example, um, a supplier might commit to employing two apprentices as part of uh, an electrical services contract. But no one ever goes back to check if those, you know, apprentices were ever employed. So I would um, recommend that you pull out of your tenders and quotes those sustainability commitments that have um, been made by the suppliers and ask them um, as the contract progresses how they're going with those objectives. Because when you get to the end of the contract, then you can actually report and say, look, as a result of um, our electrical services contract to apprentices have been put through their trade. That is a really good news story. Uh, and if you start collecting those sorts of stories, you start to build a, um, a fairly pow powerful narrative about the impact that procurement can have on the um, local community. And the final piece of the puzzle is to publicise. So it's no good if you're holding on to that information, you need to tell other people. So whether that's through a council newsletter, um, council socials, a newspaper article, whatever it is, get out there and tell people. Um, imagine, you know, if you can say, look, our mowing contract provides employment for six people with a disability who wouldn't otherwise have employment. Like these are good news stories and they're all there at your council. I would just recommend that you, you've just got to collect that information and, and start showing people what that impact is. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and you're very right there. It's, it's good to collect the information, but it's, it's also necessary to make sure that you do publish that. And Absolutely. let your councillors know and let your community know. And yeah, there's some really great um, tips there on how to, how to measure that impact. And I'm just thinking in terms of uh, our sustainable choice online resources, I think we'll, we'll pull together something um, outlining those tips for councils on there. Um, and now, finally from me, um, 
I wanted to ask you, so what, what sort of support would you recommend a council gives to local suppliers to encourage and assist them to bid for council work? The number one thing is to provide them with information. Uh, there's a lot of local suppliers out there who simply don't know how to get started with council. They'd love to pick up some council work and they just don't know how. Um, often they don't even know who to talk to at council and they'll, they'll ring around and not really be able to get through to the right person. And then they just say it's too hard, which is not what we want. So um, provide information through a range of um, you know, forums. A lot of councils now have a how to do business with council page on their website which is something I'd highly recommend their suppliers can go to and they can um, see what council's procurement policies are and understand the reasons behind what they might see as something convoluted with having to get quotes and things. Um, and provide a forward procurement plan for the year so that suppliers can see when, um, when tenders or quotes are coming up for their area of interest and get themselves prepared so they can respond. Uh, Supply information sessions is something a lot of, I've seen a lot of councils now doing where they get their suppliers in a room, uh, maybe over dinner or breakfast, and talk to them about procurement. And I know this is something LGP Consulting has um, supported councils with as well. It's being able to, um, for the suppliers to actually see council staff and see they have a face and they are people, uh, can, be, can be really helpful for, for suppliers to, um, to start wanting to bid for council work. Also having pretender briefings can help the local suppliers understand exactly what council's looking for, rather than looking at a tender document and not really knowing, uh, as well as post tender debriefs. So if they are unsuccessful, run a debrief with them, help them understand where they might have um, you know, gone wrong or where they can improve next time to help encourage them to keep trying. Like anything, the first time you do something, you might not be successful, but if you know they try again, um, having had some feedback, then, then they're much more likely to be successful next time. So I just say, look, providing information is absolutely essential. The uh, more different ways that you can do that, I think the better for local suppliers um, to, because then they have the information they need to, to win council work rather than just having to um, kind of guess. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yes. And um, I know that with LGP, we run supplier tender briefings before uh, once the RFTs are released and that that does provide an avenue for suppliers to ask all the questions and better understand what's required and, and, and what sort of um, what we're looking for, what information we're looking for. So, yeah, definitely. Um, engaging with them, open those lines of communication, um, definitely to get them on board and, and to give them a helping hand, definitely. Okay, um, thank you, Bronwyn. So that ends our beachside chat. Um, we're gonna open it up now to um, Q&A. So if you do have any questions that you would like to ask, then please put those into the chat. And I'll just welcome Sarah Lindquist, who is also a sustainable procurement consultant here at LGP. And, and Sarah's going to have a look through the chat for us and see if we've got any questions there. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Tanya. Thank you for that. Um, we've got one question at the moment. Um, and I believe that's for Bronwyn. It's relating to one of her responses that she gave to one of your questions. So the question, Bronwyn, is procurement strategies for perceived or actual complacency of local suppliers. Is that enough of information for you, Bronwyn, to respond to, or do we need um, some more information? Yeah, Tony, do you mind unmuting yourself um, just so I can, yeah, get some clarity around exactly what you're asking? Yeah, please? thanks, Bronwyn. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a, it can be a, um, it can be a, a perception in the in the rural areas. Uh, I'm sure in in the city, it's co competitive competition is is ongoing. But um, if we are local, and I'll bring this up with my council, or I'll bring it up with uh, yeah you know, um, throughout your your organisation. If you are local and you and this is also going into poor contract management management as well by some councils that have been in. But uh, there is, yeah, 
a complacency you will buy from us and I'll make it one hell of a noise if, if I actually don't. So we need to protect ourselves against that. Uh, and that's, that's obviously better administration, better, better systems in place. But, um, you know, that's, at, but it all goes back to, you know, being, being very diligent about uh, if, if uh, that local supplier can't, can't deliver on what, uh, what we're paying for, well, that is grounds for them to lose a tender. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Look, I think the messaging to, um, and I, I've come across a situation where um, local suppliers, and maybe it is a regional thing, I don't know, but they feel that they're um, entitled to council work. Uh, but, and, and I've seen some, some very high prices from local suppliers and it's just, they're not competitive, but uh, mm. so, so the messaging is, you know, they, they need to, um, they're, they're evaluated the same as everyone else. Yep. They need to have proper business processes in place because, and this, I think this is where the, um, those supply briefings over breakfast and dinner can help them understand um, what's required to be competitive. I've also had a situation where we had a contractor who they're on a panel and they complained to our mayor that they weren't getting um, enough work. But when we went back through the figures, there was five suppliers on the panel and this particular supplier was getting about 40% of the work. So in fact, they were getting more than they were entitled to, even though, and so being able to actually find that data and tell them and tell the mayor um, that that was the case, just shut that down. So, um, so yeah, there, there, can, there can be some, some tricky issues, but um, I think the more education that you provide to, to suppliers helps them understand what the council landscape is and what, what can and can't be done and that no one's entitled to work no matter you know, who you are. That's right. And it's the sense of entitlement you have to obviously guard against and that's obviously um, keeping it um, at arm's length in anything you do. Yep, for sure. No, very good. Thank you. Um, Tony, you've got a second question in here. Did you cover that now or is that separate? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say something about that. Uh, uh, we are LGP. There is a, a rebate system that you have. There are benefits and you, know, you, you certainly do a lot of the outsource uh, um, tendering and other things. So the local supplier is a mum and dad contractor, is it's it's a you know rural, it's it's um uh not you're not uh, gifted with choice like you would be in the metro areas. So we're building up uh an LGP sort of network in the country. It, it can happen but it doesn't happen all that often. So uh, there is a rebate, there is a cost, there is a cost per order and other things. How do you think that is working and what strategies do you have to get more local uh, LGP suppliers? Look, um, I don't think that's a deal breaker at all, the, um, the rebate and the associated administration. Certainly since um, LGP started focusing on um, local suppliers and if you look at our minor, sorry, minor and major works contract, um, we've done quite a lot of work with some regional uh, councils to get their local suppliers on board and have been very successful, which is why we're um, doing some more of that work. But certainly I've not heard that being raised as an issue. And um, it's also offset by the fact that they're not respond, having to respond to tenders because they're, um, it's now a much more simple quote. So, you know, it, it, it balances out. Uh, Certainly, we're getting many more um, local suppliers on board um, and regional since we've been focusing on on targeting them and and educating them about LGP. So, um, I think it's going to something that will only grow in the future as well. We've got um, quite a. I think the majority of our businesses on our panels are actually um, small and medium enterprises. They they're not all you know big multinational companies at all. In fact, most of them aren't. Um, so, yeah, even though that, you know, it, what you save here, you know, um, you might lose there, but it all, it balances out and, um, I'd suggest for local suppliers being on an LGP panel makes it a lot easier for them to pick up work with councils than they would otherwise. Okay. Do you have, um, again, stats and other things? I mean, in time, maybe at the anniversary date, we'll, you know, 
a great amount of spend has been placed with low, uh, rural suppliers. That's probably part of the part well, of the marketing. Thing. Yeah, I think so. What I've been saying to councils is that if take or take the minor and major works contract, it's a good example for those councils that have a large number of their local suppliers um, on that panel. Instead of having to run a tender for works over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, they can now run a quote, which means they don't need to go to the open market. They can direct that quote only to local suppliers, thereby guaranteeing that that work's going to be held stay locally. Um, and I think that's where the, you know, that's that's where the benefit is that you can then um, decide, you know, that work will stay local. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you have any? Uh, people walking at the terms and conditions of LGP. You, you, you're saying that the benefit of being on the panel will, you know, uh, take away any upfront cost. Look, I think it's a business decision for each business um, that they they have to make. Yeah, yeah, no, that's probably the that's probably the the answer. That's that's um, yeah, that the company has to take into account. All right, yeah, if they're getting plenty of business, I'm sure they would be. Um, all right, thank you. That, that's great. Thanks. Thank you, Bronwyn and Tony. Um, just got another question coming in now. Um, how do you ensure sustainable considerations are included in the technical specifications? Um, will you include them in there? Make, make sure that they're included. Um, if John wants to open his mic and provide a bit more information, that might help me out a little bit. Um, are you talking about formal technical specifications, John? Yeah, so before you go to the market, um, usually during the project planning stage, the project owners essentially develop the requirements that meet their business need. Um, how do you influence that? Because uh, you can provide a sustainability vehicle include it in your sourcing documents and make sure that it's followed through, but what level of assurance do you have that that is the most sustainable option? I think um, this is an ongoing piece of ongoing challenge for all procurement people and really it comes down to making sure that through the work that you're doing that you're delivering value to um, your you know, staff stakeholders so that they want to include you at the very beginning. Um, so when they're developing their technical specifications, you know, they're coming to procurement and, and asking for help um, so that they're including those sustainability things rather than, um, you know, you finding out the day before the tender is going to be advertised that they haven't put it in there. So yeah, just, just leading in from that problem, how do you know that that is the best sustainable choice? Like is procurement expected to know what sustainable technical component should be included in the sourcing document? Where do we get that knowledge? Yeah, look, I think it's not just procurement's responsibility, but also the budget holders. And often this is about having conversations with your suppliers, finding out what's in the market, doing that research, not being afraid to talk to suppliers, you know, pre-tender about what they, they, can, they can provide. Um, so that when it comes down to evaluating what's best, that council knows what they're trying to achieve and they can evaluate against that, um, having built their specifications, knowing what's available in the market. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, do we have any more questions? We don't have any more in the chat at the moment. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, there's one more from Tony here, just saying um, a schedule that would assist in the sustainability waiting. Tanya? Did you want to, is it available on the sustainable choice resources? Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So sustainable choice resources. So we have a number of sustainability um, questionnaires uh, or questions that you can incorporate throughout your um, tender documentation. Um, in terms of waiting, no, we don't have something there that suggests what you should weight, sustainability criteria, because that's very closely linked to what your individual council's sustainability objectives are. So that's, you know, like um, I mentioned, um, in terms of 
right at the upfront process when it comes to developing your tender documentation. It's about also doing that sustainability risk and opportunity analysis to work out what sustainability opportunities you could actually achieve through this through your contract and it's also about ensuring that what you've got throughout the tender documentation and what's going to go through into the project or contract aligns with what your council sustainability objectives are. So in terms of individual weighting then I would see it if you're factoring it in and you're including sustainability throughout the entire process this, the weighting, it's sort of almost, there's not really a specific sustainability weighting. It'll just be a weighting against the actual criteria that you have that already has sustainability embedded into it. And that's the way that sustainability can make a difference. Um, for example, with your um, engaging local suppliers. So if you actually have criteria in there that states that you you know, that a certain percentage must be sourced locally or um, they must engage with local businesses, then that's actually a mandatory criteria that goes in there. Um, and you don't need to weight that. That's just a compliance thing. Um, and in terms of how can I... Uh, uh, so in terms of how um, LGP does it, I think Margaret also wants to pitch in here. Did Margaret, did you want to say something here? I was going to depend on what you wanted to cover. So I was going to talk about it generally from an um, LGP general point of view and LGP tenders and contracts. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, okay. Yeah, so what we're doing here at LGP is through our tendering process, um, category managers actually engage with the sustainability people, Sarah and I, early on in the process. So we're building sustainability into the RFTs up front, but also even before that, we're building sustainability in at that um, category and subcategory determination level. So once all of that's all being put together and what's the specifications, what's included underneath those categories and subcategories. And we're aligning that with sustainability. Like for example, the minor major works, we've got the recycled materials subcategory in there. Um, and with ITNC, we're looking at the recycling of e-waste and addressing that through that actual, not only just through the RT phase, but before we get to that stage, actually, when we're actually putting together what it's going to look like. Um, then we include, sustain, we also include sustainability criteria and that's evaluated as well. Uh, and we are currently um, undertaking quite a big project, which is looking at being able to display that sustainability um, criteria or how this uh, sustainability performance of local suppliers uh, actually through vendor panel. So we're, we're putting sustainability filter tags in there so that you can search um, for suppliers that meet your sustainability objectives. So for example, if you, if you do have um, a carbon reduction strategy or you do have targets, you'll be able to search for suppliers that have either have low emissions um, strategies in place or that are carbon neutral or if they're working towards carbon neutral. So that sort of thing. Um, and Margaret, did you want to add anything further to that? Um, well, yeah, um, probably just to say that you guys have done a really good job. I'm very pleased. It's a wonderful presentation. And secondly is that um, just going a little bit deeper, when we talk about um, sustainable procurement, we, we at LGP are, are now well on our way to inducting all of LGP staff that it is sustainable procurement. It's not an alternative. That is the way we procure. It's the sustainable procurement, the only way that we procure going forward. So when we talk about that um, sustainable um, issues and outcomes are looked at um, previously, we're talking about stakeholder engagement six to three months prior to tender release. 
where the category manager puts together the stakeholder engagement process with our data team, our vendor panel experts, contract management, tendering and sustainable um, consulting. That's where Tanya and or Sarah sit in on that stage and develop the outcome that they want, the sustainable procurement outcome we want on behalf of the LGP, uh, on behalf of um, local government councils for that uh, potential contract that's going to go forward. That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> that's so right. you know um and that's our message that's our message to councils as well is that it's it's and i always say this when i speak to councils one-on-one -on -one, it's not an afterthought it's not something you can tag onto the end of something it is it is your the way you mean to go forward so you um bet um i i suppose it doesn't always work when obviously when tenders are done last minute and you know it's for whatever reason it's it's an emergency but where where we can let's try and change the way the executive level think about um, procurement that it's you know it needs to be planned it needs to be um, strategic it needs to be um, it needs to be thought about up front before we go ahead and do things so that we do get those outcomes like you know for example the the wonderful one that um, uh, you and I went out to Tanya to Campbelltown where they did the cleaning um, the, their cleaning tender, they went out for to the market with sustainability in mind being social procurement. They embedded in their tender documents the requirement that whoever, what it didn't necessarily have to be a local provider that won the um, tender, but it, they had to show that they had a percentage of local um, jobs that were included in their submissions. And that's how what they actually ended up doing. Isn't that right, Tanya? I remember correctly and so that's a really really good um, procurement outcome embedding sustainability so sustainability isn't always recycled it's not always environmental it's not always people it can be one or many aspects of those as well as an economic outcome that is um, you know that is preferred that's my view thank you <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's exactly right and in terms of um, the way that we look at sustainability um, in including that in our RFT so that it is included within the contracts is we're actually looking at a broad scope, the broad scope of sustainability requirements. Um, you know, we've done a bit of a uh, research and we've had a look at, um, you know, collected all the typical types of sustainability objectives and goals that councils would have, and we're addressing all of those different components through the RFTs um, so that it, it sort of said that the, the contracts are relevant to all councils. You can go in there, once we've got all these sustainability filters in there, you will be able to then go in there and search based on what your sustainability objectives are. Um, and I think by the looks of it, that might be uh, the end of our Q&A and I do need to um, finish up here because we've run a bit over time. But just um, in terms of concluding, so I hope that you've all found that this webinar has provided you with, um, you know, some useful ideas and tips. Certainly the, you know, what Bronwyn was talking about in terms of um, evaluating the impacts to communities, we will we'll pull together a, an online resource for that and we'll put that on the sustainable choice online resources pages um, give us a couple of weeks to pull that together and then that that should be up there um, now if you would like help to embed sustainability into your procurement process and and so that it really does make a meaningful positive positive impact to to your council and also to your community then lgp can certainly provide this service uh, our consulting team has capabilities and demonstrated experience in sustainable procurement uh, and sust the sustainability risk uh, and opportunity mapping that I was just, uh, mentioned earlier, also in uh, social procurement strategy and framework development, um, procurement transformation and review and really all stages of the procurement process. So if you do um, need any help in that, that in any of that area, um, please do get in touch with us. The uh, email address, you can see that up on the screen, is consulting at lgp.com.
www.org.au. Um, and yeah, just get in touch with us for a chat and, and we can provide you with some information and a quote if needed. All right, thank you everybody. Well, 